elements of the season and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Illuminate McCauley. The headlines. Russia warplane accidentally fires intercity near Ukraine, causing blasts on Thursday night. Fleet of Russian spy ships gathering intelligence in Nordic waters. Cuban President Diaz Canel meets with Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. A Russian warplane accidentally fired a weapon into the city of Belgorod near Ukraine overnight, causing an explosion and damaging buildings. Local authorities reported a large blast in the city, which lies just across the border from Ukraine. The regional governor said two women had been injured when a Sukhoi Su-34 Air Force plane, which is a supersonic fighter bomber jet, accidentally discharged aviation ammunition. According to Russian news agency TASS, some buildings had been damaged in the blast and a probe was already underway. Video footage from the site showed piles of concrete on the street, several damaged cars, and a building with broken windows. One shot showed what appeared to be a car upside down on the roof of a store. The Belgorod region is one of several parts of southern Russia where targets such as fuel and ammunition stores have been rocked by explosions since the start of what Moscow calls a special military operation, military operation in Ukraine on February the 24th. 2022. The Defense Ministry said it had hit what it referred to as the Bakhmut Central Command Unit of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. No details of the operation were provided, which Ministry spokesperson Igor Konarshenkov said had taken place near the settlement of Kostyantinikva, located about a few kilometers from Bakhmut in eastern uh, Donetsk region. Russian forces have stepped up heavy artillery bombardments and airstrikes on the devastated Ukrainian city in recent days. Fighting has raged in and around Bakhmut in Donetsk region for months, with Ukrainian forces holding out despite regular claims by Russia to have taken the majority of the city. Task and Army Air Force, missile and artillery units of the Russian Armed Forces in the last 24 hours hit 86 Ukrainian artillery units, manpower and machinery in 127 areas. Near Kostyanitivka, the Bakhmut Central Command Unit was hit. Meanwhile, Russia has a fleet of suspected spy ships operating in Nordic waters as part of a program for the potential sabotage of underwater cables and wind farms in the region. That's according to a joint investigation by the public broadcasters of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Finland. The broadcasters used data analysis, intercepted radio communications, and intelligence sources to show how around 50 boats have been gathering intelligence for the past 10 years using underwater surveillance equipment to map key sites for potential sabotage. Now, according to investigations, the Russian vessels have been sailing past military training areas, important oil and gas fields, small airports, deep water quays, and strategically important hubs for the Norwegian Armed Forces. The investigation also said Russian ships appear suddenly following NATO exercises. Norway and Denmark are founding members of NATO, while Finland joined earlier this month to Moscow's displeasure and Sweden is seeking to follow suit. Newly recruited servicemen for the Spartan Storm Brigade practice target firing and battlefield first aid in an undisclosed location in Ukraine's Kharkiv region. Spartan is one of the new storm brigades totaling 40,000 soldiers that Ukraine wants to use during a counteroffensive against Russian forces in coming weeks or months. New recruit for Spartan Storm Brigade, Vadim said, quote, We must carry out counteroffensive. We must push bad Russians out of here. I hope everyone understands that the more people fight against the Russians, the faster they will run out of people's 
uh, resources. That's why I joined. The new brigade, drafted by the Interior Ministry, will fight alongside regular army units bolstered by new Westerns, battle tanks, and thousands of fresh troops trained by Allied armies outside Ukraine. Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang says China is not inflaming the situation in Ukraine and advocates a peaceful resolution of international disputes through dialogue and diplomacy. Quinn said during a speech at a forum in Shanghai, in his words, as we are facing a prolonged Ukraine crisis, China is not adding flame to the fire and taking advantage of the situation, but instead we're adhering by just principles to advocate mediation and dialogue and reduce tension in the conflict to alleviate the situation. China has released a broad 12-point proposal to solve the Ukraine crisis while strengthening relations with Moscow. Beijing has repeatedly dismissed Western accusations that it's planning to arm Russia, but says it wants a closer energy partnership after boosting imports of Russian coal, gas and oil. The White House says U.S. President Joe Biden held a call with the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and discussed a recent trip to Beijing. The White House said in a statement, the two leaders discussed the importance of maintaining peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits, which added that they also spoke about Russia's invasion of Ukraine and efforts to transition to clean technology. The European Commission president visited China earlier this month to meet the Chinese President Xi Jinping. You probably saw a readout that we issued. The president had a chance to talk to pres the European Commission president, President Ursula, Ursula von der Leyen. They talked about her recent trip to Beijing. The president was interested in her perspectives being over there. They certainly talked about the need to maintain peace and security uh, around and across the Taiwan Strait. Certainly they talked about ongoing support for Ukraine and the fight against Russian uh, aggression. And again, they talked about uh, how we can together continue to work with our European partners for a clean energy transition. Meanwhile, White House spokesperson John Kirby said the United States has made no determination. The Russian private military Wagner Group is a foreign terrorist organization despite its ongoing actions in Ukraine. He added the paramilitary group was continuing to try to take control of the city of Bakhmut in eastern Ukraine and was continuing to throw a lot of prisoner bodies at that fight. Make no mistake, uh, this paramilitary contractor uh, that Mr. Putin increasingly relies upon um, is, is certainly uh, continuing to try to take back moot, for one thing. And they're continuing to throw bodies, a lot of prisoner bodies, at that fight. Uh, uh, Mr. Prigozhin uh, clearly has some personal gain here at stake in wanting to take back moot, not only for his personal prestige and, and a way to try to maybe embarrass the Russian Ministry of Defense, but also for uh, perhaps his own economic gain, since there's a gypsum mine there. Uh, not entirely clear, but it, it, he looks like he's got uh, more than one motive. Cuban President Miguel diaz Canel has met with the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov during the, later, the latter's meeting to Havana as part of his tour through Latin America. Video shows former Cuban President Raul Castro also sitting with them. During the event, the Russian foreign minister thanked Cuba for its support in Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Lavrov earlier this week visited Brazil, Venezuela and Nicaragua. Russia, hit by Western sanctions over the conflict in Ukraine, is looking to strengthen political and economic ties with other countries opposed to what it calls the U.S. hegemony. NATO Secretary General Jan Stoltenberg visited the town of Bukha on his first trip to Ukraine since the Russian invasion last year. Stoltenberg laid a wreath in memory of those who died during the occupation of the town near Kiev and visited a local church. Ukraine says more than 1,400 people were killed in the area during the occupation of Bukha, including 37 children. More than 175 people were found in mass graves and torture chambers, and 9,000 Russian war crimes have been identified. However, Moscow denies accusations of executions, rapes, and torture by its occupying troops.
U.S. Secretary Janet Yellen says the United States seeks to or seeks constructive and fair economy ties with China, but will protect its national security interests and push back against the Chinese actions to dominate foreign competition. Speaking at the Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies, Yellen said, laid out the Biden administration's principal objectives for what she called an essential economic relationship between the world's two largest economies as China strikes a more confrontational posture towards the United States and its allies. She took aim at China's no limits partnership with Russia, calling it a worrisome indication that it's not serious about ending Russia's war with Ukraine. But in recent years, I've also seen China's decision to pivot away from market reforms toward a more state-driven approach that has undercut its neighbors and countries across the world. This has come as China is striking a more confrontational posture toward the United States and our allies and partners, not only in the Indo-Pacific, but also in Europe and other regions. Progress on these issues requires constructive engagement between the world's two largest economies, yet our relationship is clearly at a tense moment. My goal is to be clear and honest, to cut through the noise and speak to this essential relationship based on sober realities. The United States proceeds with confidence in its long-term economic strength. We remain the largest and most dynamic economy in the world. We also remain firm in our conviction to defend our values and national security. Within that context, we seek a constructive and fair economic relationship with China. Both countries need to be able to frankly discuss difficult issues, and we should work together when possible for the benefit of our countries and the world. Our economic approach to China has three principal objectives. First, we will secure our national security interests and those of our allies and partners, and we will protect human rights. We will clearly communicate to the PRC our concerns about its behavior, and we will not hesitate to defend our vital interests. Even as our targeted actions may have economic impacts, they are motivated solely by our concerns about our security and values. Our goal is not to use these tools to gain competitive economic advantage. Second, we seek a healthy economic relationship with China, one that fosters growth and innovation in both countries. A growing China that plays by international rules is good for the United States and the world. Both countries can benefit from healthy competition in the economic sphere. But healthy economic competition, where both sides benefit, is only sustainable if this competition is fair. In recent years, many have seen conflict between the United States and China as increasingly inevitable. This was driven by fears shared by some Americans that the United States was in decline and that China would imminently leapfrog us as the world's top economic power, leading to a clash between nations. It's important to know this. Pronouncements of U.S. decline have been around for decades, but they have always been proven wrong. To help end Russia's war, we have mounted the swiftest, most unified, and most ambitious multilateral sanctions regime in modern history. Our broad coalition of partners has also provided assistance to Ukraine so it can defend itself. China's no limits partnership and support for Russia is a worrisome indication that it is not serious about ending the war. It is essential that China and other countries do not provide Russia with material support or assistance with sanctions evasion. We will continue to make the position of the United States extremely clear to Beijing 
and companies in its jurisdiction, the consequences of any violations would be severe. In the two years since my speech, the United States has pursued an economic agenda that I call modern supply-side economics. And now joining us is Mr. Olusheyi Adeyemo, public affairs analyst from out of Lagos here, Nigeria's commercial capital. You're welcome to the program this morning. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'd like to begin with the comments of Janet Yellen, who just spoke, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, by placing her comments next to that of the Chinese Foreign Minister, Queen Gang, the latter saying that China is not inflaming the situation in Ukraine and advocating peaceful relations, while the U.S. Treasury Secretary, seeming to me, correct me if I'm wrong, to strike a conciliatory tone, which I think will be more in keeping with the office of the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, although she's talking about the economics of their situation. What do you see with these two comments from these two individuals representing both countries? Now, it's fair that um, the relationship between China and um, U.S. is not the best. I mean, it's obvious that um, there are a lot of um, strength uh, in their relationship. But I'm happy that um, both countries obviously have mutual respect for themselves. And we all have noticed that whenever they are addressing themselves, they never go straight. They never say to us you know, expressly like they probably would have done with other smaller or less powerful countries. They're kind of very cautious of uh, the way they address themselves. It's also obvious that um, the relationship between um, the U um, China and Russia, we all know that um, is very strong. And uh, they also are very particular about their relationship as regards uh, economic concentration and that usually on the table. And so, yes, uh, for us on the side, we can continue to infer and say, maybe this is where this is going or this is where that is going. But um, the, the, the clarity on the fact that the relationships are, you know, um, China is very close to, uh, to Russia. Uh, the relationship between the U.S. and China has really not been very close over the years. They've just been very cautious in the way they've dealt with themselves. Because I'm quite surprised at uh, Janet Yellen's measured tones. If you look at the recent events between China and the United States, the alleged spy balloon that was shut down by the U.S., the allegations of China sponsoring aliens or Chinese people over the border, if the recent uh, talk and discovery of a Chinese police station somewhere in the United States as well just last week. That as well, given that Russia and the U.S. are not seen eye to eye. Is there light at the end of the tunnel? Again, I would always say that um, what both countries need to do is what they're doing. They're building their strength and they're showing that, look, we're strong, as per having the enough arsenal, we're strong as per having um, you know, a good economy that would you know, give us the opportunity if we have to talk on the table. Uh, so um, both countries, like I said earlier, have mutual respect for themselves. And for me, that's the right thing to do. Seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, um, truth is there will always be um, you know, rough feathers all of the time. Uh, because at the end of the day, there are a lot of factors you know, that are usually, you know, into concentration for all countries. Um, how can I um, maximize the opportunities of my country? How can I ensure that my trade uh, is done in a way that um, um, the rest of the world is buying what I produce? Um, what will be um, in advantage, you know, um, essentially against all the country? These are factors that would always be on the table. And truth is, um, I would not want to say um, that, um, I mean, if you're referring to the fact that there will be uh, a total peace between these countries, you know, if that's what you're referring to as having lights at the end of the tunnel, uh, you're not likely to have that, you know, ever. 
because there will always be reasons for them to disagree uh, because we're talking about, it's, it's like marketplace, whether with individuals, corporate bodies and with countries, this matter. Whenever you're doing business with other people and you need to uh, look at profit and loss, you always have um, areas of disagreement. And I guess that is what we have. But the most important thing is for both parties, both contractual parties, to be able to demand respect and do what is right to ensure that um, they are able to get the kind of respect they need such that they will be able to get uh, mutual uh, respect and uh, optimal benefit from whatever engagement they're involved in. Yes, because critics will infer that the of the American diplomatic policy that has never been uh, this weak and the Chinese have never been this strong. But looking at the war in itself and the accidental uh, strike on the city of Belgorod in near Ukraine overnight. You're, if you're familiar with the term friendly fire, where an army or uh, weapons are discharged by forces who are friendly to each other, possibly the same from the same country or even uh, allies, it's not the same thing, but it's an accidental discharge now or an accidental occurrence where in this case we understand that an explosion damaged buildings and uh, two people were hurt we know that such as war is this to be expected also given that people will criticize and say well, how could this have happened uh, but those familiar with warfare know that mistakes like this do happen i mean Nobody would say we're expecting this to happen because, of course, uh, life uh, have been lost. But uh, like rightly pointed out, yes, in cases of war and when you're doing, I mean, we had an experience in Lagos at some point where uh, the bombs at the Kedja cantonments just, you know, just went into the air and a lot of people died. Uh, you know, so when you, you know, stockpile ammunition and and and, and uh, weapons of war, you expect that. Um, Incident like this would, would happen. But like I said, nobody prays for it. Nobody's looking forward for such things to happen. Uh, we all, you know, expect that whenever you're doing things around this kind of thing, you're very cautious so that you do not um, expose people kind of death that, you know, just for court. But uh, it's an unfortunate situation. But I'd like to point out, I mean, at cases like this, there have been incidents like that all over the world that happened, uh, you know, unprepared for. But uh, again, I would always want to say, let all of us, of course, prepare better so that we'll not have um, storage incident uh, going forward. And over in Ukraine, it's well over 400 days of warfare between uh, both countries in this Russian invasion. This brigade that's called the Spartan Brigade. It's a new storm brigade totaling 40,000 soldiers. There's been talk over the past month of a counter-offensive. They have said that they're ready to strike. They've said that they will strike, and of course it's going to be suddenly. But we don't expect the uh, Russians to be sitting on their hands while Ukraine launches a counter-offensive. Are you concerned that this, the fighting just keeps going on and on? Yes, everyone. I mean, every right-thinking uh, person in the world is concerned. And truth is, the fact that they have not gone on the offensive up to now is that they've been treading on the side of caution. Uh, they've been kind of careful because they don't want to escalate the world. But one had always known that uh, if this continues at some point in time, they'll be pushed to the wall and they would have us to um, sort of go on a um, counter offensive. And one or some people are beginning to say that maybe they are being not now. Maybe what they were doing before was to sort of um, check their uh, asana to, to be careful of what they have. Maybe, you know, to know that that would be sufficient for them to go on a counter offense. And maybe they are at that point now, they feel, uh, you know, uh, confident that they, they are ready to go on uh, the counter offense. So uh, that they were not going to, you know, go on the offense was something um, as a matter of time. It was going to happen at the end of the day. And like I said, I believe that, that they had waited this long was because they wanted to manage 
uh, the, the war, as it were, and so that it would not escalate. But it's gone on for, like you rightly pointed out, 420 something days. And um, um, I mean, truth of the matter is, it is clear that um, um, Ukraine has suffered the most. And so maybe it's time for them to look at a way of, um, of, of, of going on the offense. I guess that's what has happened. Now, Mr. Ademo, let's talk about espionage. That has been brought up nearly a time throughout this war, especially recently, uh, given the Evan Gershkovich accusation by Russia and his, his, his uh, being detained by Russia for alleged spying, uh, the release of the um, leaked documents from the Pentagon that involves spying, and now another case of alleged spying involving Russian ships off the Nordic waters that it has been discovered, if it's proven to be true, going on for over 10 years. But what's interesting for me is uh, that it was said to have been discovered by broadcasters, not the intelligence forces or services of any of the countries or its allies, but by uh, the public broadcasters of Sweden, Denmark, Norway, and Finland. Are we seeing a situation where, um, in this century, we're seeing the lines blur between the intelligence services and what the media can muster? I mean, clearly, the truth of the matter is, uh, and I'm sure you will agree with me, um, that when we go for training, uh, as we got um, what we do as journalists, um, we're, 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 you know, we're trained in a way that we're able to conduct investment. We do apologize, uh, Mr. Adeyemo couldn't finish his thoughts on the issue, but we're speaking to Mr. Olushi Adeyemo, a public affairs analyst from out of Lagos. When we return, U.S. Embassy in Cuba lights up in Ukraine, flag colors during Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov's visit. Details in a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Russian Central Bank Governor Elvira Nebiolina said the fluctuating rate of the Russian ruble reflects reality and Russia's current economic strategy has justified itself. Nebiolina said the bank was committed to maintaining a floating exchange rate and would only directly interfere in the currency market if there were a risk to financial stability in the country as it was in spring 2022 when Western nations started imposing punitive sanctions on Moscow over its military actions in Ukraine. The central bank has become wary of inflation this year warning of the risk of a widening budget deficit, weaker ruble and labor shortages, its key rate currency stands at 7.5%. Annual inflation decelerated sharply to 3.51% last month due to the high base effect. Prices in March 2022 rose by 7.61% month on month after Russia sent tens of thousands of troops into Ukraine last February. Private investigators say suspected North Korean hackers infiltrated a software firm that claimed hundreds of thousands of customers around the world in a cyber attack that shows Pyongyang's advanced hacking capabilities. The breach of the software firm 3CX discovered last month provided a potential foothold for the North Koreans into a huge swathe of multinational firms from hotel chains to healthcare providers that use the firm's software for voice and video calls. The number of companies affected by the hack and what the hackers ultimately did with access to victim networks remain unclear. But it's the latest evidence that North Korean hackers are pulling out all stops to break into organizations to steal or spy on them in support of dictator Kim Jong-un's strategic interests.
a Dutch diplomat who was appointed less than three weeks ago to promote Dutch involvement in the reconstruction of Ukraine has quit over remarks he made in a new book. Dutch media reported that Ron van der Tel, or Ron van der Tel, made comments including Ukrainians are also Russians. We must not forget that that is the reality. The Dutch foreign ministry said the former ambassador to Serbia, Poland and Russia will immediately step down. Minister for Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation uh, said she respects the decision and has accepted his resignation. The ministry said Van der Tel's comments were made before his appointment earlier this month, but published after he took up his new role. Denmark has lifted restrictions on sailing in waters near the Nord Stream pipeline leaks, saying it was no longer dangerous for ships. But the Danish Maritime Authority said it still discouraged anchoring, fishing and seabed work within one nautical mile of the leak due to underwater obstacles. The pipelines, which linked Germany and Russia, were damaged by explosives last year, which sent large amounts of natural gas rising to the surface. The cause of the explosives and who was responsible is yet to be determined. And now we'll be speaking with Mr. Chukwemeka is a former lecturer and diplomatic and consular relations law, faculty of law, Nasser State University. You're welcome to the program. You're joining us from out of the FCT. Thank you for being with us. Good morning, Lumide. Good morning, Nigerians. Now, let's begin with this uh, misstep. I expect from uh, the Dutch diplomat who was appointed less than three weeks ago to promote Dutch involvement in reconstruction of Ukraine, uh, having quit over remarks he made in the new book. I'll just repeat for our viewers who says, uh, where he says, Ukrainians are also Russians. We must not forget that is the reality. Now, did he say anything that wasn't true? And how far off was the statement? Obviously, he has been relieved of his position. Yes, uh, partly I agree with him because uh, Ukrainians are seen in Russia as second-class Russians. And history shows that Ukraine and Russia were uh, constituted one entity at a time before they became different. And uh, for those who know the geopolitical terrain, of uh, Ukraine and Russia, any, post, any Russian, Russian was the language spoken even in Ukraine until this war became serious. So but this is not the best time to tell this truth. Ukrainians have the identity, Russians have the identity. But you recall USSR, in the era of USSR, in the era of Stalin, when they were planning anything, they were always looking at Ukraine as part and parcel of them. It was just in 1989-1990 that Ukraine came to become a sovereign country. And uh, as such, uh, you, you look at even the Orthodox Church in Ukraine, it is, they, they bear allegiance to the Orthodox Church in Russia. Almost everything uh, they, do, they did in Ukraine uh, took its root from Russia. So uh, to that extent, the, the, the man that just resigned uh, spoke the truth. But it, in a time of war, it's not the best time to uh, say certain things. I think he said it at a very wrong period. Uh, but yes. uh, definitely Ukrainians have a separate identity, but to a large extent, they are linked and interlinked, dependent, on Russia in several ways. History bears that uh, testimony. Yes, you can see why that will be particularly offensive to Ukraine and the allies of Ukraine. Now, looking at the war and the casualties and the consequences of this war, there are over 8 million displaced Ukrainians because of this war. 8 million. And this war is well over 400 days. Now, are you concerned that this displacement will continue to not augur well for the Ukrainians? Certainly, it will not go well for the Ukrainians and the war. Uh, contrary to my uh, 
previous view that the war may end this year, it's very likely that the war will not even end this year. So uh, more people will be displaced. Recall that uh, Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of NATO, uh, is on a visit to Ukraine, and uh, he said that uh, Ukraine will likely be invited during the NATO meeting uh, coming up in July to join the alliance. And uh, Russia has said, has justified its aim of invading Ukraine, that it is one of the reasons it is, is an existential danger to Russia for Ukraine to become part of the NATO alliance. So the, I think this uh, 8 million people may even rise beyond 8 million because the war will drag on beyond the, uh, we, the point we initially expected. The war is going to, up to 2024. Uh, two countries have uh, actually paid for uh, some tanks to be supplied to Ukraine, uh, Leopard tanks to be supplied to Ukraine in early 2024. So if they are already making plans to supply tanks early 2024, it means the war will drag on even up to 2024. It's no longer a short gap war. It's going to be a very long war, especially with this announcement by uh, the chief of NATO that uh, Ukraine will likely join uh, NATO. But it seems in practice it will be very difficult for, uh, for a while for Ukraine to join NATO because I don't think Hungary that is, has a uh, support for a little support for Russia will be signing off on that because for you to join NATO, all members will say yes because an attack on a member is an attack on all. So look at what Denmark is going through. Finland has joined, but the two countries, basically Hungary and, and uh, Turkey, are refusing to, to swallow the bait. But, uh, so in the case of Ukraine, in the midst of war, uh, it will be difficult, but the announcement alone is sufficiently to spur Russians never to give up quickly on this war. And the previous negotiation where there were security guarantees that Ukraine will not uh, take such steps, Russia has uh, bungled it and uh, currently, const uh, going by the current leadership of Ukraine and the thinking in within the circle, definitely, they will, want, they will want to give in to any form of uh, condescending to Russia again. And Russia will feel circled if it allows Ukraine to join NATO. Finland has already joined. Denmark will join soon. And if Ukraine is allowed to join, uh, I think uh, this is something Russia will not allow. And the war will dra drag on for a very long time. It remains to be seen how far along the Hungarians will hold on in uh, not permitting Sweden to join or not giving their, their say-so for Sweden to join Ukraine alongside Turkey. But now to the visit between uh, the foreign minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, and Cuba's president. Paris Daisy, do you see, for those who think that it's a sideshow to the Ukrainian to Russia invasion of Ukraine, this new world order that is being touted with China at the helm, Russia at the helm. We have uh, the Russian foreign minister having a sit down with the Cuban president, former Cuban president Raul Castro there. Um, he visited Brazil, he visited Venezuela, he visited Nicaragua. Is, is this new world order which Russia has said is what they'd like to happen and let the power shift be taken away from the United States. Do you see this has happening? Is it something that is going to happen? I see it happening, and it has, it has already started happening. Uh, let, let me give you some examples. The BRICS, that's uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. They are already hell bent on establishing a new world order. They have established a development bank 
And the second example is, see what Kenya has done. They are happy that they won't be spending $400 million monthly purchasing oil from several countries, especially Saudi Arabia. Now Saudi Arabia is ready to accept the yuan. That's the, the Chinese uh, currency. So these are shifts. There are several shifts. And this visit by the uh, Russian foreign minister to the countries that are not agreeing with uh, the United States, that refuse to be under the United States influence. Uh, recall the, the last election in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro, who is pro-US, lost the election. So as it is now, Brazil is entirely within the sphere of China and Russia, Venezuela, Nicaragua, uh, Cuba had always been a traditional ally of Russia. So uh, they will definitely, and you recall recently during the visit of Xi Jinping, the Chinese premier, to Russia, they declared that there will be no barrier to their relationship. So the obvious implication is that a new world order is being created. Look at the happening in Sudan. The Wagner Group is citing the RSF as reported. So, and they also want to build a base around the Red Sea. So basically, Russia is very serious in creating a new world order with China. And this is happening before our very eyes. Many countries, if they don't go for their for the security setup, they will go for their money. And China for a long time has started the Road and Belt Initiative, through which it has been helping certain countries to engage, I mean, to improve their infrastructure. That's economic diplomacy. Combine all this with the BRICS Initiative with the countries that in Latin America refusing to cooperate with the United States of America, and in Africa, the Central African Republic, the activities of Russians there, Mali, Burkina Faso, and Sudan, plus South Africa. So you will see in totality that a new world order is being created. If you look at all this, a new world order is already being created. It's quite a struggle. It's quite a competition. And definitely it will come to pass, especially by this embarking on this economic ventures whereby countries will not need the dollars to make purchases within the inter international trade uh, sphere. So that is a big push that will definitely create a new world order. Yes, and I want you to remain on this issue of U.S. leadership and its influence in the Ukraine war, taking, to, taking into cognizance as well the leaked reports from the documents from the Pentagon, which allege if you uh, in the know that uh, Egypt, if that's true, uh, surreptitiously was about to uh, supply Russia with weapons uh, or, or supplies in its war against Ukraine. Yes, I'm, I'm, about, I'm aware of the leak. It's not just Egypt. Many countries are relating with Russia, some openly, some secretly. And uh, uh, they look at a lot of things. Uh, the, some of them have a lot to gain from Russia. Some of them have relationship beyond what we see on the surface uh, concerning Russia. And some of them actually detest the United States of America, but in the open, they will pretend to be aligning with the United States of America. So it's not just Egypt. Uh, with more leaks, you will be aware that many more countries are trying everything to circumvent the sanctions against Russia. And uh, if Russia really finds out that many countries are against it, it will even have a rethink in the war it's having in Ukraine. But basically, Russia is aware that several countries are, are siding it, whether openly or secretly. And you are, you are aware that Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, addressed uh, the Mexican uh, lawmakers. Uh, whereas the 
government of Mexico is neutral, the legislature is being uh, impressed to urge on the government no longer to be neutral. So the, the push is everywhere. I just hope this will not lead to a third world war, but the push is everywhere. So at the end of the day, every country will find itself either supporting the United States or supporting Russia or pretending to be neutral. But the world will get to a point where it will be difficult to be actually neutral. So I'm not surprised that Egypt supplied weapons to Russia. And like I said, with my investigation, you discover that many countries have been supplying weapons to the Russia. It's just Iran that has come out openly, perhaps North Korea and some other countries, but many countries would and are ready to do business with Russia. And some have not forgotten how Russia helped them uh, during their independent, uh, I mean, when they were struggling for independence. For instance, South Africa will always stand with Russia uh, any day, and they don't pretend about it. For instance, the BRICS meeting. South Africa is a member of the ICC. South Africa signed the Rome Statute and has an obligation with the warrant of arrest placed on Vladimir Putin to ensure the arrest of Putin when he visits South Africa for the BRICS meeting, which will come up soon. But South Africa will not arrest Putin. And they, so they prefer to, to, to go against the obligation under the Rome Statute than to comply with that obligation. So that's to the extent you can see that if countries can take these positions, then supply of weapons to make money will not be a strange thing in this contest or in this war between Russia and Ukraine. Daisy, we also reported on the White House and the call between President Joe Biden and the EU European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, and they talked about the Taiwan Straits, and they also talked about the EU Commissioner's visit to China, and all this with the fact that Russia, the United States, and China are still not seen eye to eye. Diplomatically speaking, is the United States playing its cards right in its support of Ukraine? We know that they're supporting Ukraine as much as they can, but are they sending conflicting signals at any point? And also, can you talk about, finally, NATO's uh, involvement? Thank you very much. I think when it, com when it comes to China, China will look out for its primary interests first before looking at Ukraine as it concerns the United States and uh, China. There are two major issues affecting their relationship. And that's one, the South China Sea. China doesn't want the interruption or disturbance of the United States. It wants to operate as a regional power. And beyond that, even as an international player. And as such, it feels everywhere around Asia should be left for it. And that United States should not interfere. That's one. Two, Taiwan. Under the one China policy, China has a, a, not only by policy, but by law, that any country that enters into diplomatic relations with it will adopt uh, simultaneously the one China policy. That is to say, you will not recognize Taiwan as an independent island. You will not rec rec uh, recognize it as a sovereign country. So uh, United States, you are aware, as far back as 19, I think 1971, uh, changed this policy from recognizing Taiwan to recognizing China. And as such, uh, the obvious implication of that is that you will have dealings to deal with Taiwan. But United States has the Taiwan Act, whereas it intends to protect Taiwan's interest. Uh, and China is seeing this as intrusion into its uh, internal affairs. But they don't That's have the way China sees it. So these two issues are even have... beyond Sorry the to one you, Bryce, Daisy. So you can Yes, they don't have official relations with Taiwan. 
officially yes. the United States has no United official States relations. United States doesn't have official relations with Taiwan directly. But, 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 but indirectly, but then you have Kevin McCarthy it and is Nancy protecting Pelosi. Taiwan. Can you say that again? Your final thoughts. No, I was saying that uh, the Nancy Pelosi visit and Kevin McCarthy uh, uh, visit as well concerning uh, Taiwan, both parties in the United States. But we'll have to leave it there, though. We'll <laughs> take your final words and your final thoughts because we run out of time. Thank you, Barrister Eze. We've been speaking uh, with uh, Barrister Chukwe Mecca Eze, former lecturer on diplomatic and consular relations, law, faculty of law, Nasrallah State University. Thank you for coming on the program. Now, finally, on the program, the U.S. Embassy in Havana lit up in the colors of Ukraine to show their unwavering support for the Ukrainian people. The move comes as Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov met with Cuban President Miguel diaz Canel and Foreign Minister Bruno Rodriguez in Havana, the latest in a series of visits to shore up support amongst Russia's closest allies in Latin America. Lavrov told reporters that Russia and Cuba, both facing sanctions from the U.S., understood one another. Cuba, which has been under a U.S. economic embargo since shortly after Fidel Castro's 1959 revolution, has repeatedly expressed support for Russia in Ukraine and a diplomatic solution to the crisis. And that's it for today's special coverage of Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Alumide McCauley. Do have a great weekend.